what we're going to be having a look at today is leases. Uh, so what we're going to be having a look at is what a lease is, what leases are. I'm pretty sure that pretty much everyone here knows what a lease is, but we'll go through it in any event. Um, more importantly though is why, why accounting for leases is problematic and what some of the issues around them are, because there are some substantial issues and that has an impact on the regulation. And it's actually driven some of the, the reasons the issues that we see in lease structuring at the moment is driven by the type of regulation we currently have. Uh, so we're going to have a look at that regulation. We're going to look at what a finance lease is. We're going to look at what an operating lease is, and we're going to look at sales and lease sparks. So those are the three things we'll get sort of get our teeth into. So what is a lease? Now I'm going to start this actually with a story. Bear with me. Um, so last year, some of you may have known. I think I may have, I probably have talked about it if not a long time ago. Um, so we spent six months in London and then a few weeks after that on holidays around Europe. Uh, so f to get to London, you don't do it by boat, or you could, but it's gonna take an awfully long time. So we flew there now, um, which obviously makes it a lot quicker. Um, that said, traveling with a two and a half year old, actually no, she was nearly three at the time, is an interesting experience. Um, and it makes flying without someone to look after after that so much easier. Like it's unbelievably just not stressful once you've flown with a kid to then fly not with one. It's so much easier. Anyway, we flew over there. We then had to look for a place to stay. Now this is obviously an Australian house. You think you can hazard. Um, that's not what we found in London, but we had to go to Lisa place and we did so for six months. Um, we then went around Europe, and that is actually, it's not the car that we hired, but it is the same make and model. It's a pretty sexy looking thing. Um, it is a Renault Grand Scenic. Um, it, we, to say we weren't overly inspired by it when we saw it, but we just needed something that was big enough. And it was actually quite a, it was a really good car. Only kind of, everything failed only once, one, one night late in France, and luckily it sort of, all started again five minutes later. Um, but you know, it was good. So we leased, we, we leased that for a couple of months. And on the weekend I got bored and rented Godzilla. I wouldn't recommend it. It's not one of the better movies going around. But the reason I bring all this up is these are all actually assets which are leased or things which are leased. Obviously Qantas, I'm not leasing that plane, but Qantas itself, a lot of their aircraft are not actually owned by them. They're actually leased aircraft. Um, and that's actually a substantial issue, which we'll get into. Obviously, most, you know, if you're not living at home, if you're living out of home, more likely than not, you're renting. That's a type of lease arrangement. That's what I'm doing at the moment. It's what I did in London. Um, when we went to Europe for a couple of months, we leased a car, and then we got really short-term leases. Like, you know, in, I didn't actually even get the physical copy. That was just renting it through iTunes for a 48-hour period. So that was 4 or $5. That's a lease as well. Um, so the issue with this is if these things in a way are all very different, you know, we're talking about a 48 hour situation to a two month situation to a six month situation to some of those aircraft, you're talking 10, 15, 20 year leases. If they're all accounted for in the same way, that's going to look kind of funny. Um, so what we're looking at is a situation where the regulation actually looks further into the types of transactions and the types of assets that you're dealing with and the, and the type of scenario and accounts for it in different ways based on that particular scenario. Um, so a lease is an agreement whereby the lessor, so whoever has the asset or whoever owns the asset, conveys to the lessee in return for the payment or a series of payments the right to use that asset for an agreed period of time. So Renault, or whoever it is we hired it off, will provide me that car or provide us that car to use for a couple of months. Um, Landlords, if you're renting at the moment, they will provide you the use of that asset in return that you provide them payments. That's, you know, if you lease stuff, that's what it's about. And they are quite diverse in nature. So if we unpack it a little bit, where's Nick today? Because that, it's not a, it looks like a Toyota. I don't know what sort of car, but on one hand, we've got a car, on the other hand, we've got an airplane. Now this is, you know, two, this isn't even the ends of the spectrum, but you know, it gives you a bit of a sense. The car on one side, $17 a day is probably not a very large part of that asset's value. 
like, you know, that doesn't look like an expensive car, but it still looks like it's going to be worth more than $17. Um, that said, the car that I, the, I sold my car before I bought my current one for $500. So you do get cheap cars out there. Um, the reasons I sold it for that cheaply, but the guy that bought it was a mechanic, so he knew what he was getting himself into. Small part of an asset's life versus, in some cases, if you're buying, if you're leasing an aircraft, but if that aircraft has, say, a 25-year life, and you're leasing it for 25 years or 24 years, that's not you using it for a small part. Like that's essentially like you own, like you're having it for the entire of its life. So, how is that different from buying the asset? if you're basically going to use it for its entire of its life or nearly all of its life. Um, so a small part of life, asset, fi asset value, so, so only a day or a weekend or whatever it happens to be versus quite a substantial part of it. Assuming, you know, you'd assume in most cases as long as they haven't written the car off that their car will return. Um, whereas the aircraft, someone may, they may actually buy it out at the end. They may use it right the way through until that asset is scrapped. So it's a different situation that you're looking at here. Um, it may very well be, not so much in the case of aircraft, but it may be that you have had a piece of machinery built for you that only it's, it's really only built for that organization. It can't be used anywhere else. So if you're leasing it from them, they can't really take it back off you and then lease it to someone else. It wouldn't work for them. So these are all things to think about in terms of where the risks and rewards of ownership lie. Now, what we've seen in this subject, and if you're doing ABC or if you've done ABC, you have seen the same thing. What is, for somebody to consolidate a subsidiary, what do you have to exhibit over that company? You've got to exhibit control. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have 100% ownership. It doesn't even necessarily mean that you have 50% ownership. So it's not necessarily ownership which is the key thing. And what we see in this particular topic is that you don't have to own an asset to be able to recognize it. And that's what we're picking up. It's not control, it's, sorry, it's not ownership which is the important thing, it is control. It's the economics of it which are important. Um, similar, I suppose, to what we were talking about last week with equity and sort of financial instruments where you've got equity instruments and liabilities. Just because someone calls it you know, some sort of equity type thing, share capital, doesn't necessarily mean it's equity. That may well be debt. So it's the economics of it which are important, not what it's actually called. Um, and does it matter at all? Well, it does. That's a bit of a straw man because it tells us whether something should be on the balance sheet or not. We'll have a look at this um, when we start putting some numbers into play. But this idea that a lease can actually be a really similar economic thing to borrowing money and to borrowing money and then buying something. Um, and the actual, when you work through the transactions and work through the sort of the profit and loss and the balance sheet effects, it looks much the same. So if someone is going to go off and borrow money and then buy an asset, we would we reflect that in a certain, certain set of journal entries. But if they were to basically do the same thing, which is to get an asset and basically do it by implicit borrowing from a lessor, they should show a similar set of, effect, similar set of entries to pick up that difference. When we use some numbers, that'll make more sense. So to give you an idea of what the problem with this is, so Qantas have just over $10 billion of property, plant, and equipment on their books. I would urge you to have a look at these. I would urge you to have what's well, actually part of the, the assignment that you got due near the end in that we want you to have a look for these sort of things. I'm pretty sure it is part of it. So it's got about $10 billion worth of property, plant, and equipment. Um, of that, about 12.5% at least. So of those recognized amounts, of that 10.5, about 1.3 is leased. They don't own it. So that is a recognized leased asset. That's not a problem. That's fine because it's, it's in the financials. Where the standard setters have an issue, and I think it is an issue, is this number here, the 2.8. Because these numbers here, these are not recognized. These are disclosed numbers. So on one hand, it's okay because they're disclosed. We can actually see them. Like I haven't just you know, called up Qantas to say, you know, we know you've got these hidden numbers, tell us what they are. This number is provided in their financial statements, but in the notes. 
but they've structured it in such a way, and we'll look at what operating leases are in a second, they've structured these transactions in such a way so they don't have to include them in the financial statement itself. Because arguably, when you look at that, a non-cancellable operating lease, if it's not cancellable, you are on the hook for it. You will have to be paying that. Um, and that's a sub that is a substantial amount of money that you're dealing with. Now, that's, that would have both a liability and an asset effect. Now, <clears throat> what I've done down here wouldn't, it's a back of the envelope calculation. It wouldn't actually be what would happen because that 2.83 billion, some of it is due within the next 12 months, some of it was due within the next five years, some of it was due after that. So once you bring in present value effects, that leverage impact wouldn't be as high, but there still would be an increase in the leverage. Um, and this is, this is pretty much explicitly the reason why the standard setters are trying to crack down and change the standard that we currently have is because companies employ clever people. They have people that realize that if we structure these arrangements in such a way, we get them off balance sheet. And that's exactly what's happened here. So we're going to look at what reasons are to bring things on balance sheet and, and you know, what happens with that. So it is substantial. So for one company, you're talking nearly $3 billion worth of things which are unrecognized liabilities and assets. Um, so there is a divergence. Economic substance implies lease capitalization and legal form implies just expensing it out as you use it. So to go back, <coughs> so with an asset, because what we're going to be dealing with here is you've leased something and you, you may well have an asset, you may well have a liability. So an asset, when we look at it from a framework point of view, is something you control. It is not ownership. So just because we don't have that piece of paper, the title of the thing which says, hey, you are the owner of this, doesn't mean you shouldn't bring an asset onto the books. Similarly, <coughs> a liability is where you have a present obligation from that. And if you've got a non-cancellable operating lease, to me that sounds like you have an obligation. It sounds like, and most people would expect it to be that. Um, and that, if you then sort of tie that back to the uses of accounting, it's not necessarily going to have a contractual use unless the contracting parties actually build in those lease commitments into the contractual numbers that they're using. But it may well have an impact on the decision numbers, on the decision making, because when you look at that, you can build in, do we think these things are assets and liabilities? You have that ability to do that if you're aware that they're there. Um, so the framework is an economic model lease, which suggests lease capitalization. Right, so 117 on leases. Key aspect. So this is a big thing. And this is where, you know, companies very much have incentives. One of them we've just seen, which is a leverage incentive. And we'll run through some of the numbers to make this more clear. But is if you don't bring a lease onto the books, well, if you, sorry, if you do bring a lease onto the books as a finance lease, you're going to be mechanically increasing your leverage. There can be no other effect from that because that lease is 100% debt financed. So unless your company is 100% debt and no company is that, you'll, you have to be increasing your leverage. There is a second impact, which is a profit impact, which we'll look at in a moment. Um, but companies very much have incentives to structure leases as operating leases if they can get away with it. Um, so a finance lease is one which transfers substantially all those risks and rewards. So in effect, it looks like you own the thing. You don't technically own it, but for all intents and purposes, it looks like you do. An operating lease is everything else. So it's not defined. And if you think about that, that's a handy way to do it because if you had this was defined in a particular way and this was defined in a particular way, I'm sure you could get someone to figure out a way in which it doesn't sort of fit within any of them and then they could do whatever they want with it in a way. So they pretty much go on, look, here's a finance lease. We're going to define what that is. And then if it doesn't fit that definition, it's just an operating lease. It's outside that, it's outside that realm. So to figure out what a finance lease is, Paragraph 7 through 19 help us with that. Now, the examples in paragraph 10 suggests, help us suggest a finance lease. Now, I'm going to actually ask you guys a question, and I, I've got a feeling, actually, a few people answered in the affirmative in the day lecture, so it might not be too bad. 
How many of you have seen the movie The Castle? Okay, so a few people. So what we're kind of talking about here is the vibe of it. It is, you know, when we look at this holistically, does this feel like a finance lease? It's not, have we ticked off, you know, just, you know, if we've only ticked off two things, it definitely can't be. It's, you know, in sum, does it feel like it's transferring those risks and, risks and rewards? These things will help us figure that out, but, you know, it's not sort of a, we have to tick all five things and yes, you do, and if you miss one, you don't. It's the overall effect. Which is important because what this means is for people to make these determinations, you have professional judgment. That is where you have people in the organization saying, you know, we're having a look at the, you know, the contractual requirements of the lease and this is, we feel it is a finance lease. Or we feel in this case it is an operating lease. But once you start bringing your professional judgment into it and subjectivity, it means people can start also just classifying things in ways they probably shouldn't. So, I mean, there's a double-edged sword with that. It means that if you have an absolute rule, and this is a problem with some of the US standards. So, for example, um, which one is it? The lease term, for example. So, in the US, they don't have that sort of terminology. So, here it's just for a major part of the asset's life. Major part isn't defined. In the US it is. In the US it's defined at 75%. So you see a lot of leases in the US at about 74%. Because even though, if, you know, there's not that much difference between 74 and 75, but they've got very much a bright line rule. So as long as it's under that 74, they don't hit that threshold and they can go, it's not a finance lease. We don't have that. So 74, if everything else kind of fits, you've got one. Um, so, again, you're looking at it, if you get ownership at the end of the lease, that's probably something suggestive it's going down a finance route. If you've got an option to buy at less than fair value, same deal. If you're going to be using it for the major part of the asset life, you're probably in that same boat as well. If you're only going to use it for two days and the asset could last for 20 years, yeah, it's probably not so much, but there may be other factors at play. Um, the amounts that you're going to be paying for it, are they pretty much the same as the fair value of the thing? Um, is it something very specialized? So you're looking at these range of factors and making a determination based on those. Right, so into the nuts and bolts. Okay, so we have a finance lease. So at this point, we've gone, we've, we've looked at all those factors and gone, we have a finance lease. And I can pretty much tell you, if you're going to have a practical question on leases, it's going to not be an operating lease. Um, as we will see why in a few moments. So at the commencement of the lease term, the lessees, so we're looking at the, the company which is getting the asset. So the company which is getting the use of the asset, they recognize an asset and a liability at that point in time. So let's see if I can... Do -do -do. So what we basically got, we got... Now the thing is, a lot of the stuff we're about to do, you've already done before. Once we've got an asset, it's pretty much like we've got property plan equipment and we just have depreciation, we deal with it just like property plan equipment. Once we figured out the liability amount, it's just like what we did with debentures. There's an effective interest, in, in essence it's the effective interest rate and we do just like what we did last week, we do just like what we did in week six. So a lot of, the practical stuff we've actually already covered. It's just some of the upfront things that we haven't. So that's what we're gonna be looking at. So we have an asset and a liability at amounts equal to the fair value of the lease property or if lower the present value of the minimum lease payments. So what we're getting is the fair value versus the present value of the minimum lease payments. And you take the lower of those two numbers. Um, this will generally be given to you, this you'll generally have to calculate, and that is just a present value calculation, um, which we'll, we'll look at in a moment. The discount rate to be used is the interest rate implicit in the lease. In our <coughs> situations, this will be given. Um, if you've got any initial direct costs, um, you add these just to the asset. And that makes sense because think about what happens with property, plant and equipment. Think about what happens with inventory. Think about what happens with intangible assets. All of those costs to get that asset there, you include in the cost of the asset. 
That's what we're doing with these initial direct costs. If they're there, we add them to the cost of the asset. We're not adding them to the, to the lease term because that's payment to somebody else. We've already, we may well have already paid these costs. This is a small little one, paragraph 23, no set off of lease assets and lease liabilities. This is really important. And we're gonna look at why it's important in the next slide. Yes. So the reason why it's important. So let's start actually putting some numbers to this. So let's imagine when we started off, where are we? And we have assets of 100, liabilities of 20, and equity of 80. So that will give us, if you're looking at leverage as liabilities over assets, that gives you 20% leverage. Now let's say we've gone off and we've entered into a finance, we have a situation with an asset with a finance lease, and it's for $50 million, both the asset and, li and the liability. So it's a $50 million lease. Now what will end up happening is, assets move up to 150, liabilities move up to 70, equity stays at 80. So we've added 50 to both the assets and the liability side. That means we have, if you think about it, this from sort of weighted average cost of capital type thing, we've got you know, $100 million of assets at 20% leverage, and then we've got $50 million at 100% leverage. So the leverage will naturally go up, and in this case it goes up to, if we round it off, to 47%. So you know, that's a big lease for the size of this company. So I mean, it's not, it's not that realistic, but you can see what's happening is that by adding in, by adding into the lease asset as a finance lease, you will naturally increase the leverage of that company, which is an absolute reason, incentive for companies not to have it as a finance lease to stop that from happening. Now, the other thing to make note of, and that was what paragraph 23 was getting at, is there is no set off allowed. Because imagine what we've just added. We've added assets of 50 and liabilities of 50. What is the net effect of that? If we took the, yeah, the net effect of that is zero. So if we took the net effect of that, we just have $100 million of assets and $20 million of liabilities. It defeats the whole purpose of what we just did. So once you build in once you figured out that asset and liability, you can't then just go, okay, we're going to net them off, or like what we call set off, net them off and show nothing because there's no point in doing the whole thing now. So what we've just done is increase both the assets and the liabilities by the same number and that will naturally increase the leverage of the business. Um, so what we're going to do first when we get to some of the, when we work through this, is to figure out how we got this number. So initially how we came up with the 50 million or whatever the number we have to do for the example. And then once we've got that number on the books, how we then deal with it over time. So present value of minimum lease payments. Those are important because what we're trying to get at to get that 50 million or whatever the number that you're trying to find is, you're looking at the fair value, which we're going to provide you. And that's just whatever the value of that asset is versus what the present value of the minimum lease payments are. To figure out what the present value of the minimum lease payments are, we need to know what minimum lease payments actually are. Um, this is where, look at the definitions in the handbook. Like this is, this subject or this topic is a really good one to actually be looking through because a lot of these things are defined in there very clearly what they are. Okay, so let's imagine this is why I don't design cars. Okay. It's awfully quiet without Nick here. Anyway. So let's imagine, actually, anyone who's renting, you know what a periodic payment is. 
That is just, you know, your weekly, your, your monthly, your fortnightly rent. Um, so let's say we've got a car and we, are, we as a group are leasing this car all together. The, we're going to be paying $10,000 a month, so $10,000 a year at the end of each year to lease it for four years. Those regular payments, that $10,000 we pay at the end of that year, the end of that year, and so on, those are your regular periodic payments. That's fairly straightforward. What I want to talk to you about is the guaranteed residual right now. So, and you do see these um, around the place. So let's imagine... Let's imagine a guaranteed residual of, of 50. So we've got, the four, we've got the 10, 10, 10, 10, and then we've got a guaranteed residual on top of that of 50. Um, I need someone who wants a car. Okay, so Danielle. So let's just say we're going to change this up a little bit. So Danielle is actually the person who's leased the car. So you will pay the end of each year for, for, end of each year for four years, uh, you'll pay $10,000. Now at the end of that, there's, a, and this is in the contract, so this is just, it doesn't have to be in every single contract, this is just in our situation. We've guaranteed the value of that car when you return it. So when you return it, well, you don't have to return it to me, we'll get to that, but at the end of four years, you have to provide me in some way, shape or form, if I'm the lessor, $50,000. Now that could be that you're just giving the car back. Now if you're giving the car back, the car itself has to be worth $50,000. If it's not, you gotta make up the difference. So we'll get an independent sort of assessment valuation, figure that out. If it's not worth it, you have to stick in some money to make that sure that works. If you want to keep it, you just pay me $50,000 and we're done. So in terms of a minimum amount that you have to pay, you know at the end of that fourth year, after you've paid that regular payment, you're going to be providing me $50,000 of assets in some way. It could be returning the car, it could be giving me cash, but that is a payment that you're going to have to make. Again, it's a minimum lease payment, so as long as you're giving me 50, you're right. If it's more, then you know, happy days for me, but you don't, you don't, I don't give you money for that. Um, so it could be, you know, so this is just picking up the minimum amount that you're sort of going through. Um, Do the previous payments matter? Do the previous payments matter? So if she gives you the 50 at the end, yep. can you subtract any previous payments she's made? Like these ones, or? Now, well, these are two separate, so the contractual terms would be you're paying me 10, like each year, and then you're also paying me 50. So, yeah, you wouldn't, I mean, if she paid some of that, like, in addition, up, like, earlier on, then I'm sure there might be early, kind of, sort of early options on it, but um, let's just sort of keep it simple and just say she's paying the regular 10, and then at the end, you've got to pay 50. Now, what I want to talk about, I'll skip bargain purchase for the moment, I just want to talk about unguaranteed residual. Unguaranteed residual plays a part, but it doesn't play a part for Danielle. So for the lessee, it doesn't matter. Where the, where the unguaranteed residual starts to play an important role is for the lessor. So for me, it will make a difference. So if we made that unguaranteed residual, so say there wasn't guaranteed residual, and we got rid of this, and just went, there is an unguaranteed residual of 20. That is not and part of the minimum lease payment structure for Danielle. That is not something that she has to pay me. What that 20 is picking up is what I believe that that car will be worth in four years time. It's not money you have to pay me. So if there's no guarantee residual in there, you just pay me the four tens and then that's it. If the car happens to be worth $5,000, that's not your problem. You're not paying me anything more. So that's, it is a big difference. So the guaranteed residual is the only thing we need to worry about for the less E. Now, bargain purchase option. Uh, sounds much like its name. So let's imagine, the numbers are probably slightly off for the type of car that it is, but let's imagine Danielle's car, and I'm gonna ask, this is a question for everyone in the room. Put your sort of business hats on. $10,000 each year for four years. Now at the end of that, I've given, and we're, we're about to see what this car is. At the end of that, I've given Danielle an option to purchase this car for $30,000. And so this is the car that she's, been, that she's been renting. Now I wanna ask each of you guys, 
Look, that's a pretty fancy looking car. You don't even know to need to know the exact amount that it's worth. It is worth a fair bit. You've had it for four years. Should Danielle buy it off me for 30 grand? So it's, that's about a $250,000 car, brand new, just to give you, you know, and I'm completely above board. I'm not a, I'm not shonky with this. It's a legitimate car. It's all working. Should she buy it? Is 30 grand for a four year old Audi R8 a good deal? Yeah, absolutely. It's a good deal. So should she buy it? Yeah. I'll take it. We'll take it. What happens if you don't want to drive it? What happens if you actually don't want that car? Yeah, you sell it. I'm sure there's someone else out there who will take it off your hands for more than $30,000. If you want to buy it and you actually want to drive it, well, it's a bloody good deal, so you take it. So the idea with this is she's not locked into paying that money. Like that $30,000, you don't have to, you could walk away from that. You'd be stupid to walk away from that. But, you know, Christ, if you didn't have the money up front, you could work out a way to finance it through someone else and then figure out how to, you know, there'd be ways to make it happen. But the important thing is, we include that $30,000 as a bargain purchase option because no one in their right mind would not exercise that option. You would absolutely take it up because if you didn't want the car, you could get rid of it. Someone will buy it for more than that. And so you do include that bargain purchase option in there. I should have changed that and put in a Toyota Land Cruiser. Anyway, anyway. okay, so we've got the asset. We've got the asset and liability, we put those numbers up. What we then have is how to deal with the liability moving on. The liability, the minimum lease payment, so the amount that you're paying, should be apportioned between the finance charge and the reduction of the outstanding liability. If anyone has a credit card, that's pretty much what's going on. If you, you're paying and you've got a balance and you've got interest accruing on it, as long as you are paying your payments are greater than the finance charge which, or the interest which is being accrued on your card, you'll be reducing your outstanding liability. That's all that that is. As long as you're paying more than the interest costs each month or each year or whatever it happens to be, you'll be reducing the liability balance. And that's what's happening here. So we're just taking the amount that you pay, splitting it between the interest cost and the amount that you're reducing the liability. The finance charge is allocated based on, allocated to each period during the lease term so as to produce a constant periodic rate of interest on the remaining balance of the liability. So in a way, this is the effective interest method in another term. Um, so the, the table that we looked at last week, we're gonna be doing it again. So it is good to just kind of keep rolling with these things to make sure you're comfortable calculating them. Uh, with the asset, a finance, lease, a finance lease gives rise to depreciation expense for each depreciable asset. Um, the depreciation policy for depreciable leased assets shall be consistent with that for depreciable assets that are owned. So that asset that you bring on, so again, we literally have, if you think of the balance sheet, we now have an asset which we just deal with by having depreciation and we have a liability where we figure out kind of the effective, that's not spelled right, the effective interest method. We've seen both of these things. None of this is actually all that new to you, so it's just sort of tweaking the edges of it. And that's really annoying. Uh, how do I get rid of... There we go. <clears throat> the only thing we have to be worried about with depreciation is how long we do it over. So if we've got, if Danielle's leased this car for four years and the useful life of the car is 10, do we use four years or do we use 10 years? And the way we figured that out is basically on Danielle's intention on whether she's gonna give the car back or keep it. If Danielle intends to keep the car for four years and give it back at that time, you just use the time that you've got the car. If she intends to keep it and keep it for 10 years, then you depreciate it, depreciate it over 10. So you're just looking at how long you think you've got the car for. Whether or not that actually holds true, that's not necessarily relevant at this point. You will make those estimates each year to check what's going on. But if you intend to keep it, that's what you use, use 10 years. Um, you can impair assets, we're not gonna do that here, but it's an asset, same issues. Which gives rise to the first of the examples. <coughs> Things could be made more complex in this. 
I mean, certainly have a look at the examples and, and some of um, the past papers as they come out. The one thing I want to mention, and it's drawing off some of the feedback I've been, today has been a longish day because I've been talking to a lot of people about mid-semester exams and, and reviewing them and, and having a chat to people. Um, one of the things in construction contracts, if you had a look at your papers, this caught out a few people, was we didn't use costs to date, we used costs in that particular year. And I suppose with this, just be careful with, you know, these sort of questions or with questions in exams, just be really careful about what you've been told. Um, and the reason I bring this up is, for any of you guys renting, like, you know, renting where you are at the moment, how many of you pay your rent after the fact? Like, you know, you live there for two weeks and then you pay the rent after you've lived there for two weeks and you always pay afterwards. No. You always pay rent up front. Like, it's always in advance. Um, so in this case, you just got to be careful with things like that. Like, when do the cash flows actually happen? Because that will have an impact on the present values. That will have an impact on the payment structures. So, for example, in this case, the payments happen in arrears. So in this case, it's always at the end of that year. Um, there may be, you know, upfront payments. So you just need to be careful of when payments occur. Um, so just be really careful about it as you, as you read this. So Plummet Airways leases an aircraft for five years, and they do so on the 1st of July 27. Can I see how long we've had this example for? Um, from ABC Bank. The fair value. So we've been given the fair value here, and the fair value is 100 million. Uh, the lease payments are a really funny looking number, $16,108,236 annually in arrears, and there is a guaranteed residual of $50 million. So what we have is, one, two, three, four, five. So we've got 16.1, 16.1, and 66.1. So it's the four, well, it's five regular payments of 16.1, so those are your periodic payments, and then it's that one final guaranteed residual which does get included. If that said it was unguaranteed, then we wouldn't put it in there, but we have a guaranteed residual, so we have a final cash flow of 66.1. The rate that we use is 7.5%. Um, you can be sure in an exam we'll give you something which is round because otherwise you can't use the tables if you need to use them. And we've been given information about the useful life and the residual and whether or not they will keep it. That'll be for later on. You'll have to trust me with this, that the present value of, the, of this set of cash flows is 100 million. There we go. We have which was obviously why the number was kind of funny because we just wanted to make it even. So we have a $100 million asset, a $100 million, million liability. Those two, whichever one we pick, it's going to be the lowest. So the initial entry, so the in entry on the 1st of July 2007 is the fair value is 100. The present value of the minimum lease payments is 100. We pick up an asset and a liability of $100 million. And when I was talking about leasing versus borrowing or buying, this is being factored in. So the rate implicit in here is, this is the rate which is implicit in, these payment, in this payment structure. But imagine if we'd done this differently. Imagine if we'd gone out and borrowed the money, borrowed $100 million, and then went and bought an asset from somewhere else. So imagine we did that. The entries that we would have would be debit cash, 100 credit liability, 100. And then we'd have debit asset, 100. Credit cash, 100. And these two net out, and what you're left with is debit asset, 100, and credit liability, 100. So different transactions, different ways of structuring it will give rise to the same outcome. So whether or not you borrow the money and then buy the asset or whether you just lease the asset with sort of implicit borrowing included, you're going to see the same set of entries, which is effectively debit asset credit liability. 
Um, so what we have here is the liability structure. And this number right here is the, balance, the opening balance of the liability. In this case, both assets and liabilities are the same. It is possible that the assets and liabilities are slightly different because you may have in initial direct costs in there. So what you're picking up, that's not the asset balance, that is the liability balance. The payment is pretty straightforward, that's just how much you're paying. Interest is the 7.5% times the open. So 7 point well, 100 million times 7.5% gives you 7.5 million. An information column only. So this is, you don't need to have this in, but it helps. The difference between these two is 8 million. Sorry, 8.6 million. Uh, 100 million minus 16 plus 7.5, which is what we're doing, gives you a closing balance of 91. That 91 comes down, repeat the process, comes down, repeat the process, comes down, repeat the process, and just keep doing that to your heart to your heart's content. And what we finish with here is that very final payment, the guaranteed residual amount. But you could also, if you really wanted to, put the $50 million in that bottom line just here, and that means that balance will be zero. Either way, you'll still get the things that you need to get. The reason we do this will help give us these entries that we need. So this section here is the liability. So what with the liability, that looks really similar to what we did last week and in week six. We've got the, the actual expense in relation to it, which comes from this column. We've got the actual cash component which comes from this column and we've got the difference which comes from just here. So the lessee is paying money out, credit cash. We are then apportioning that payment in between the finance charge, or the lease expense in this case, and the reduction in the outstanding liability. And so just what the standard was requiring us to do, we split that out. And you would then just simply, actually, we'll hold this in a moment. Um, we take, we've done the liability section, we still need to do the asset section. The asset, we have a $100 million asset and if you go back to the information, and I won't flick back, otherwise we'll be flicking backwards and forwards all day, the residual amount for the asset is um, zero when you look at after 20 years, and they expect to keep it. So we're doing it over 20 years. And that gives you $5 million a year. And that's the asset. You can call it amortization, you can call it depreciation, I'm not, we're a little bit agnostic with that. Um, but it's picking up what's happening. You, you're taking that asset and you're picking up sort of the spreading out of the cost of that asset over its useful life, depreciation, and then you're also picking up the cost in relation to the money that you've borrowed to buy it, or effectively buy it. And then you would repeat this whole set And then you'd repeat that whole set of entries as required for each of those five years. So you just roll down through the different levels, change the number slightly and you're away. And when it comes to that very final number, if we're going to keep the asset, we're not giving the asset back. So we just simply just credit cash because that's what we're giving up. And we get rid of the liability that we have there and it's cleared out. You don't have to, I mean, um, so if, or, or say, say the reverse, if in this case what we were doing is, we were basing this number, I'll take a slightly different take on your question and just, if I'm going off on a tangent, let me know. But with this one, we, we made, we've come up with that $5 million because we're expecting to keep it. 
So if after five years we then give it back, you're saying is that going to be a problem? Is that a, yeah, is that sort of a reversible? You have to recognize it if you, if so your intention in the beginning was that Yeah, and that's fine because you're allowed to 108. So WSB 108 allows you to change your judgments and estimates on things. So these these numbers are based on your judgments about what was going to happen. You you don't have to get locked into them. Same as with say just normal depreciation on a normal piece normal. <laughs> Um, property plan equipment, you are allowed to change, like you may think it's going to be around for 20 years, you may change that estimate down to 15 years, and you don't have to then go back and change things in the past. Yeah, but for example, now you decide that you want to sell the asset. Yep. So the residual value will be like 90 million or less, or less, 80 million. So you're going to have huge loss. Yeah, so, okay, so if you come to, well, after five years, so after five years, you'd have the asset sitting at 75 million. Yeah, well, but I'm just trying to, so you'd have the asset sitting at 75 million and then you're giving it back. You'd be debiting, this lease liability would be debited $50 million. I'm just running, going off the top and like sort of running quickly through. So that'd be $50 million because that's gone. You've given the asset back. So you need the asset and it itself it's needs like to- in a way, you're reducing the liability by 50, you're reducing then the asset or the, the net asset that you got there by 75. So the assets come down by more, so you're picking up 25. a 25 loss. Mm -hmm. But in a way that makes sense because if you, if you were gonna give it back, if you intended to give it back up front, then this depreciation charge would have been higher from the get-go. So you see, it just kind of means you're gonna see this sort of lump coming through right at the end, like right at that point in time. And that's, that's fine. Because that's, your intention was to do something with it and then you change your intention and for whatever reason, you make adjustments to that. Um, yeah, that, that's fine. We only do these if we recognize the lease in the balance sheet. Yes, so this is a finance lease. We'll get to, look, you know, when I, when I rented the movie on the weekend, I'm not gonna, okay, look, it was only about $4 and I don't run a balance sheet, but I wouldn't recognize an asset coming on my books and then sort of portion out and then give it back. It's just, I paid cash, I would have $4 expense, which is, um, when we move to the, le to, so this is the operating lease. So if this same thing was done as an operating lease, which is kind of your question, um, simply just recognize it as, where is it? And that would be it. That would be like literally the sum total of what you'd have to do. So if we're going to ask you a practical question on leases, it's not going to be that because that doesn't really do anything. Um, do you have to reclassify the asset? Do you have to reclassify the asset? Um, you probably should. Let's go. Yeah, look, I mean, it depends on how, yeah, look, we called, yeah. Um, yeah, we call it lease asset. It's probably good to bring it on then as like change out from lease asset to just asset. I mean, we're also happy if, I mean, you're probably not gonna lose marks for that sort of thing. I mean, it's like, but yeah, you, you technically, you now have an asset and it's not a leased one anymore. So yeah. That's interesting how it doesn't go like that. Anyway, um, the one thing I wanna do before we look at, um, One thing I want to look at is we've looked at the leverage impact and then we'll just take a quick break um, before we look at lessors and sales and leasebacks. But I want to look at a profit reason why companies would prefer, also prefer, prefer operating leases. Now, this is going to require me just playing around on Excel for a little bit. It's not something you can write down. I will make the file or a very similar file available online as well so you can see what I've done. Um, but just, there's, there's a reason for this. Uh, so if I can get out of. It's like week 10, you should know where you're at. Um, keep. Uh, don't know, discard. Okay. Now with this one, I'm going to use a different example because just the example that we had does some funny things with it and it doesn't quite reflect. Oh, that's annoying. 
Uh, zoom. Okay. So let's imagine we have an asset with its a lease term of 20 years, a useful life of 20 years. Um, it is payments in arrears, and those payments annually are, what number did I use before? 10 million? Uh, rate, 10%. I think that's all the information I had before. Cool. Okay, so what we've got is a lease term and a useful life, which are the same, 20 years long. There's payments of $10,000, $10 million in arrears. There is no guaranteed residual, no unguaranteed residual, no bargain purchase. The only money that is being paid is the $10 million each year, and there's a rate of 10%. So if we figure out payments T1, T2, you know, oh, that's annoying. Okay, we figure out the net present value of that. <coughs> okay, just trust me with this. So the net present value of this is $85 million. So we've got an $85 million asset we would put up on a balance sheet and an $85 million liability. So if we set this up, so opening, in a way it's gonna be really handy for people when exams go computer-based because writing Putting these things together is, no one does this by hand. I don't know why we get you to do it by hand, but anyway. So the opening balance is this one right here. Uh, the payment, actually you don't need the payment here. Uh, the interest is this times that. Get rid of this. And opening Okay, let's hope this all works out. Yeah, yeah, okay. I know you can't see all the way down, but what we've just done, payments, so there's a $10 million payment at the end of each. We started with 85 million. We've got interest, which is the 10% times the opening balance, and we've got a closing amount, so I've kind of got rid of one or two columns along the way. So let's see, how does that look from can you guys see that right up the back? Like, just good to get a different perspective on things. And we've got time, so that's all good. Yes, it's really legible. Okay, so much a much bigger version, and obviously you shouldn't be writing any of this down because we haven't got to the reveal yet. Um, so the point of this is, if we think about, this is an expense item. Okay, so that is, if we just look at the interest expense, I'm pretty sure everyone's comfortable with why that is because the liability balance is dropping, which means there's less opening balance each year for the interest expense to be working off. So over time, the interest expense, and remember, so this is an expense, so this is a negative profit effect. So it's pushing your profit down. The biggest negative effect of your profit is earlier on, where it's just over $8 million. By the end, you're showing basically zero effect as a, as a profit and loss effect from this particular lease. Get rid of this. Now, that's not the only cost you've got in relation to a finance lease. You've also got depreciation. And we're assuming it's this divided by 20. <coughs> that's gonna be a consistent amount each year because it's just the $85 million allocated over 20 years, which is about four and a bit a year. So the total expense is going to be the total expense for this particular thing as a finance lease the biggest hit to your profit happens early because that's when the that's when your liability balance is the biggest which means the interest expense is the largest so in these early years, you've got like a $12 million, so 11 million, 11 million, so on. And by the end, 
you're coming down to only a $4 million, $5 million profit and loss effect on that particular lease. So it declines in time. Now, that in itself isn't enough to say, hey, let's do things as operating leases. What is the next thing is if we look at what an operating lease, the expense on an operating lease. So this would be the total expense on a finance lease. For an operating lease, it is simply the payment. And if we put these two together, what we see is a really strong reason why companies would prefer to structure these things as operating leases, not finance leases. Because the early years for a finance lease, the profit is your profit is going to be lower. It's in this block here, from here to about time 12 or so. In these years, you're going to be showing a larger expense each and every year until you hit that point. And at that point, then the operating lease becomes a higher expense transaction than the finance lease. The total is the same. If you actually sum each of these up, that sums to $200,000. And you'll have to trust me, it's real. Look, you guys can read this bit. I'm pretty sure, can anyone read that bit? You guys can read. Can anyone up the back read that bit? Oh, you guys have got good eyes. Anyone right up the back can read that bit? No. <laughs> yes, no. $200,000. Each of them are $200,000. All we've done is change when that $200,000 profit, or so that $200,000 expense happens. Now, if you are involved, if your remuneration is based on profitability, it only starts looking better after about 12 years. So that means you've got to hang around for another 12 or 13 years before you start to see any beneficial profit effects from that being structured as a finance lease. Now, this is even saying that you can adjust what the structures are. You may not be able to, but if you can, there are incentives, really strong incentives, both from a profit point of view and from a leverage point of view to have these done as operating leases. So I know there's a lot of numbers sort of sitting behind that, but what we wanted to show is how we got that particular graph, because I think it's more useful to see how it was got put together rather than just say, look, here it is. Um, but as I said, I'll make that available in some way, shape or form so you can see what I've just done. Um, but on that note, we'll take a break just for a couple of minutes uh, and then we'll come back and have a look at lessees, sorry, lessors and sales and leasebacks. So we've done, we went, when we get the asset, when we flip that around and look at, it's an exciting time of year. When we flip it around, it is pretty much the reverse. Um, it's not exactly, but it is pretty much. There's one thing, and we alluded to it at the start, that we need to take, we need to pay attention to. So what is that? So we're looking at a finance lease. So if it's a finance lease and I am, let's say I am the lessor and we have Danielle who's bought the car and Danielle has picked it up and we've had that, the, the regular payments of 10. So those are part of the minimum lease payments. What I do, I'll be getting, that asset of mine is off my books. I have, I do not have control of it anymore. Danielle has control. So it's gone off my books. So something, asset has been credited, we need to have a debit for something. And we're picking up some sort of receivable. At lessors should recognize assets held under a finance something. I don't know why I cut it off there. Anyway, as a receivable at an amount equal to something. So I'm picking up some sort of receivable as an asset. We then need to figure out how much. The amount that we're picking up is the amount equal to the net investment in the lease, um, which is defined in paragraph four, the net investment in the lease is the gross investment in the lease discounted at the interest rate implicit in the lease. So we need to then figure out what the gross investment in the lease is. And I know this is me stepping through it. It's all on your page already. So it's not like it's kind of a surprise, but the gross investment in the lease is the minimum lease payments. And we know those minimum lease payments include things like bar bargain purchase options, periodic payments and guaranteed residuals. But what is not included in the minimum lease payments and something Danielle gets to ignore 
are unguaranteed residual amounts. That's not something she includes in her minimum lease payment structure because that's not something she's going to have to pay. So let's, for example, say that I had included, I thought there was an unguaranteed residual on this car of $20,000. She does not include that in her minimum lease payments because Danielle is not going to be paying that in any way, shape, or form. What that $20,000 reflects is money that I think I can get for that asset in four years' time from somewhere else. So I think I could maybe sell that asset off in four years' time and I'm going to get $20,000 for it. That means it is an asset to me and I build that into my value, but it's not, it's not money coming from Danielle, so it's not something that she's including in her liability structure. And that's all that it is. So the decision point really for when you guys see any of this is if you're dealing with the lessee, so Danielle, you, you ignore unguaranteed residuals. When you're dealing with the lessor, so who is providing the asset, you need to build them in. And the thing is, this information is all in ASP 117. It is all sitting there for you. So it's not like you have to remember this stuff. It helps if you do. I mean, it makes things a lot quicker if you're working in there. But that information is sitting there with you in the exam or if you're doing this in practice, you don't have to absolutely remember it, but it helps. Um, subsequent measurement, the recognition of finance income. So the, the finance income I'm getting from Danielle in this case, because what I'm doing is I haven't sold her an asset. I've basically lent her money. That's what I've done. Um, the recognition of finance income shall be based on a pattern reflecting a constant periodic rate of return on the lessor's net investment in the lease. So the amount of whatever I've reflected, I just need to work out the rate and then kind of just portion it out nice and neatly, which is what we're about to do. So same information, and I just repeated it so you could see it, although you guys have it with you. So the same information, but we're now looking at the bank's point of view. And from the bank's point of view, they're giving up an asset of 100 million. The least receivable is 100 million because there is no unguaranteed residual here. There are the regular payments of 16.1 million. There's the guaranteed residual of, of 50 million, which is part of minimum lease payments. So we've got the minimum lease payments of $100 million present value, and there is no unguaranteed residual. So the net investment in the lease is 100 million. And then I simply apportion that out over time. And it's just the 16.1 that I get in from Danielle and then I split it between reducing the receivable and picking up the revenue for it. So this, because there is a lack of unguaranteed residual, it is a literally a mirror image of what we just did. So you can imagine it could be made more difficult and have a look at examples of that where we add in, the guaranteed, add in an unguaranteed residual. So that's something to be aware of. Uh, and that's lessors. So lessors are, you know, relatively straightforward once you get that first little wrinkle out of the way. Operating leases, that's even easier. I get money in from Danielle. I get money in from Danielle. As, a, as an operating lease in this situation, it is just I get $16 million in, I get $16 million of revenue, that's it. That's all that I do. It's like iTunes or Apple when they, when they rented me that movie, they just reflect that they get $5, $5 worth of revenue, $5 worth of cash. That's it. That's all that they do. Um, and they probably pay very little tax on it because I've leased it from Ireland. <coughs> Sales and leasebacks. I need something physical. Mm. Ah, it's big, it's an umbrella. Okay, is this gonna be too big? Maybe. Okay, depending on what the weather's like, this could be quite a useful thing if you've got an umbrella and don't have a jacket today. Uh, so what, we're last what the last thing we're gonna be looking at is sales and leasebacks. So sales and leasebacks is just like what the name suggests, you're selling something and then you're leasing it back. It's not that complicated. Um, why do they do it? It's a form of finance, and we'll look at an example of that. Actually, we'll look at that example right now. So, a month ago, Woolworths sold over $600 million worth of property and leased it straight back. 
So it didn't mean they all had to move out of their premises and then move all back in. Um, just as a paper transaction. And they raised $600 million from it. I don't know if you're aware, and I know we talk a little bit about Woolworths, massive business. Um, won over a billion dollars worth of sales each and every week. Like huge. Um, they also have something like seven or 800 pubs. I don't know if you knew that. If you didn't, you do now. My local bottle shop is a Woolworths bottle shop. BWS is Woolworths. You probably are aware of that. My local service station is a Woolworths service station mixed up with Caltex. My local pub is a Woolworths pub. Um, it's owned by a ALH, I think it is, which is a pub business which Woolworths have a 75% ownership in and have control of. Um, my local supermarket, it is a Woolworths. Um, they're bloody everywhere, these people. So they do take a lot of... There's now a Woolworths just opened up opposite the library. Um, so with this, it's to raise finance. So this is actually part of their, prop, their pub portfolio. They sold the property and just then leased, and then leased it back. And that's not a problem. I mean, it's completely fine. In a way, it's not dissimilar to a reverse mortgage on property that you already own um, and then just you know, more taking out the mortgage, in essence, in essence, a mortgage on it. The issue from an accounting point of view is how do we deal with that? Because we know there are different types of leases now. So imagine... Anyone forget an umbrella today? All right. And you don't have your beard to protect you, so you probably need one. So I sell this umbrella to you. You can hold it, yes. And then you lease it straight back to me, so you don't get to hold it anymore. Okay. What's your name again? Harrison. Harrison? Okay, so I, lease, I sell it to Harrison. I then lease it straight back off him as a finance lease. Question to you. Did a sale ever really happen? What are the things we need to consider when we have a sale, going back to week two, sale of a physical thing? Transfer of something. Transfer of? Ownership. Of ownership. Ownership? Are we talking about sort of risks and rewards getting transferred, talking about control? If this is a finance lease, so I sold it to Harrison and then lease it back under a finance lease, who has control? I do. So I have control because I own it, I sell it to him, and then I lease it back and I have control. Did I ever really sell it? Tree fell in the woods. <laughs> Maybe not. If I lease it back on an operating lease, because I'm just going to lease it back from you for a day because it's wet today, and I'll get or maybe a week because I need it, and I won't see you till next week. Um, maybe then, maybe it's an operating lease. Then a legitimate sale, you could say, has happened. So that is something that we need to take into consideration: is does a sale actually really happen? So with a finance lease back. So Harrison has sold it and given it back to me. So again, the thing is, there wouldn't actually be like physical handover. It would just be paper stuff and I'd never actually let go of this. Um, if, where is it, where are we? So if this was on my books at 10 and I sold it for, oh, what's a good number, 15, and I was gonna use it for three years, and it's a finance lease. That five dollars, oh, that's a rubbish. That's not a number. Five years. Um, if I made a five dollar profit on it, I do not get to. You know what I normally show is, um, and let's say it's not inventory. Let's just say it's an asset. Um, so we debit cash coming in of fifteen. We credit the asset of ten. And normally, what we'd get to pick up is credit again of five. This doesn't, this doesn't happen anymore. This will be deferred. So that $5, we don't get to show a $5 profit in that first year. What happens is we will defer that over the five years that I use it or intend to use it. So I will get to show a $1 profit each year. I will sort of, this will happen, this is way better than the laser pointer. This will happen in that in time one, uh, sorry, time zero, and then time one, you'll reduce that deferred gain by one and bring out a gain of one. And then in time two, you'll just slowly bring that back in. But the thing is that's gonna be offset by the fact that this asset is now gonna be deferred over that five years, not at $10, it's gonna be deferred at $15. So I'm actually gonna be having a $1 higher depreciation each year. So it actually all nets out. Um, so it's just a way of getting finance. So that's a finance lease back. 
Yes. Just gains are deferred. So if it's a loss, well, I suppose, and that's a good. Yeah, you'd recognize. Well, that, and that's a good point, and we're going to see a little bit more of it in the next slide. But if you think about, even though we know the, the reasons for people to push things down, it's not a proper analogy, but consider if you guys got to play around with your marks for a subject, are we worried about you pushing them up or down? Yeah, so that's the concern. So by and large, and the research holds this, hold, you know, holds this as well, is that auditors are going to be worried and people that are looking at these things are far more worried about people pushing profit up. Even though there are legitimate reasons why management will want to play, and play around with things and push it down, and that's not, I mean, that is a problem as well. But by and large, the problem is, the concern is people pushing it up. So, yeah, in this case, the profit is the pro or the gain is the problem, not the loss. But that's a good point. Like, it's, it's, so it's asymmetric in that treatment. Um, uh, which, in a way, segues us to the next section. And I'm going to have to use a clean slide because there's not enough room on this one to do what I need to do. Um, but if, when we go through the next little bit, keep this in mind or keep this visible so you can see it. Um, if Harrison has bought, bought this from me and then leased it back, but he's, he's now just leasing out, you know, you've got a stall outside and when it's wet, you get to lease these out and hopefully people will bring them back. Um, you know, all those people who lease textbooks. Yeah. It's not a, and that's not a bad business model. I think they're making a fair bit of, mo fair bit of money from it. Um, so sale, what the impact is, is basically determined on where the sales price sits in relation to the fair value. So that's the thing which is important. Um, so there's actually three numbers we need to consider. There's the sales price, there's fair value, and there's the carrying value. So it's a very final thing. We'll, final thing, and then just a couple of comments I need to make, and then we'll wrap it up. So keep this clear. Okay, so let's imagine the first situation, and we have, <coughs> we've got a carrying value of 10, we've got a fair value of 15, and we've got a sales price of 15. So I've got this on my books at 10. It's been depreciated, it's been used a little bit. Um, I sell it to Harrison for 15, but these are in the market for 15. I've sold it at market. He could have bought an umbrella for anyone for 15. I could, sell, I could have sold it to anyone for 15. Everything's fine. Um, and in that case, profit on that sale. So it's a carrying value down to sales. Profit's five. Happy days. So if it was, you know, that's, that's all good in that case. Where it starts to get a little bit different is, well, maybe a little bit different. If the carrying value is 10, if, this, if the fair value is 15, but if the sales price is 13. In that case, the profit is three. And according to paragraph 61, that's fine. So I've got this umbrella, which is on my books for 10. I could have sold it for any one of you guys for 15, but I sell it to Harrison for 13. Now, May have been because he had a really awesome beard, I don't know. Um, but for some reason, I've sold it for under what I could have got elsewhere. Now again, that's underselling, that's, you're allowed to recognize that profit kind of similarly to why the previous example, because if anything, we've made less money than we could have. That's not to say there aren't risk factors involved because I could be, there could be something on the side there, we've got other deals going on. So there are, it's still something to be considered, but from an accounting point of view, you can recognize that. Where it does start to become problematic is if it's 10, fair value is 15, and the sales price is 25. That starts to ring alarm bells because that profit of carrying value 10 to 15, that profit of 10 to 25 of 15, that's a bit strange. Why has Harrison bought this from me for 25? A bit weird. What's that? I did value myself. Nice guy. You just, people with beards are awesome. I don't know. Like, um, yeah, but if it was wet outside, then the, the fair value for everything would have pushed up. But that is a good point. It, you know, it could have, but the, the fair value for everything would have, would have spiked in that particular period of time. 
So then that's probably sort of saying, oh, hang on, what's going on? Is it related party? Are there other things going on? Why has, why has that happened? So in that particular case, I might put this umbrella down. Get it. Throwing it around like no one's business. Um, so this profit of 15, what you do is you take the excess of the f over the fair value and you defer and amortize that. So the excess of the fair value is 10, so we defer that and the five is okay. So we actually split up kind of what was sort of the normal profit and then we defer that other profit. Um, and you'd probably still come under a question from the auditors as to why that happened and there may be legitimate reasons, but yeah. What's that? You defer it over the time that you use it. So have a look at Paragraph 61, have a look at what they I'm, I'm just clar I'm just quanti clar yeah, not clarified, so but you yeah. Away, you yeah, basically. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, if you use it for a really short period of time, then you can pretty much sell it. So yeah, I mean, it's a good point. Um, the last one is, if you have a carrying value of 10 and the fair value is seven, We haven't even sold it at this point. If the carrying value is 10, the fair value is seven, the first thing that you do is you write it down because you're carrying it in excess of its fair value. So the first thing you do is you have a write-off and so you pick up a $3 impairment loss and then whatever, we haven't figured out what we've sold it for and then you know whatever gain or loss that you need here and that's it. So if this is an issue, but um, the main thing to be aware of is, look, and all, those, all that information is in the standards, like you'll have that at your hands when, when you're in there, but it's just to be aware of there's a very much, there's a very big difference between a finance sale and leaseback and an operating sale and leaseback. Um, cool. Okay, so last thing, last thing, and then I wanna make one quick comment about next week and we'll wrap it up. New standard. Actually, one comment. It doesn't really affect you guys so much. And I don't know how public it is yet. I, th I thought it was, but the timetable. I think the timetables for next semester are out. They are. I think they might be. Anyway, um, partly a reason that like, passing the subject, you want to pass the subject because you want to pass the subject. And I can understand that. You don't want to have to sit here and listen to all this again and watch me wave an umbrella around. Um, New standards are coming out. Revenue has come out. Leases, which they've been working on for the last eight years, they are hopeful that it will come out next year. You know, they are starting, give it a couple of years, and, this, and what we're looking at won't be the same standards as what we will look at then. Um, so that's a reason to sort of get through it. Second thing to get, reason to get through it is, and not so much of an issue for you guys, because you guys are the, are the evening class, but there will be 8 a.m. start to lectures next year. Um, yeah. Anyway, so, and I, and I, what's that? Yeah, so there, there are eight o'clock starts to lectures. Um, and I know I've copped one for next semester, um, which, so <laughs> it may not, it doesn't really affect you guys. The day lecture was like, ah, but I suppose you guys are all nighttime people anyway, so it may not affect. Um, Yeah, well, that's going to be me. I've I've an eight o'clock start, and then I'll have a six o'clock lecture to finish off with. So. Yeah, it's fun. Um, before I get to the last little bit, so one thing for next week. Next week, next week we are going to be looking at tax. This is fun as a topic that is. No, it's an interesting topic, and the thing is, tax. Tax at the moment is a really topical issue. If you've been following on some of the issues around Google and Apple and you know, some other companies that we'll talk about next week, there have been substantial problems with tax and transfer pricing, which is also you deal with you know, intercompany transactions in ABC. There are massive tax effects that the reason why companies go through that, and we will look at examples. Um, when I rented Godzilla, I didn't rent it from an, from an Apple server in Australia. I rented it probably from a company in Ireland. Um, they cop, the way Apple have set things up is you, their Apple subsidiaries in Ireland are the ones that make the money, not here. So they don't get taxed here, they get taxed over there. We'll talk about that in more detail. I put up examples and I put up links to things on our Facebook and our Twitter and, and things on, there are really good articles on some of the issues around tax. The G20 meeting, which is gonna be happening next month, one of the big topics in that is on tax. It, it's a pretty 
interesting era. One of our people, um, one of our now newly minted um, associate professors actually is looking at tax and looked at, uh, what's the company? Hang on. Who's involved with the soccer? Frank Lowy. What's his company? Westfield. Yeah, that's right. He looked at Westfield and how little tax that they pay. There are substantial issues in tax at the moment. So we'll be looking at a few of them next week and understanding how the tax expense that you see on a profit and loss statement is not where even close to the amount of tax that they pay. Those numbers don't necessarily are not related. Um, and we'll look at why that's the case next week. Um, but start reading around, seeing what's out there. It's, it's a pretty interesting field at the moment. That's about it. So enjoy. Hopefully it's not too wet outside and you make it home safely. And I'll see you guys next week. <laughs>